Hello, everyone. So I'm part of the same team as uh, Octavio. My name is uh, Tal Jorgensen, and I'm a research associate at the um, at Laurentian. Um, but uh, yeah, working on on the VMS thematic product uh, project um, like Octavio. So I'll be looking at assemblage level compilation of the uh, Abitibi Greenstone Belt, and then we're going to look a little bit on uh, the use in assessing uh, the differential metal endowment with respect to BMS um, using those compilations. So Octavio has pretty much said, said this already, but uh, we are sort of interested in how do assemblage scale tectonic, magmatic, and crust mantle processes sort of control this metal endowment or differential metal endowment during the construction of the greenstone belts. And um, I think Octavio as well had, had uh, this figure here that you probably also saw yesterday in Tom's talk that sort of shows well how um, some of these assemblages in the Abitibi are more endowed. Um, and, you know, I kind of liked Tom's idea of changing the view on, on just looking at the, the chronostratigraphic sort of uh, constraint, but, but also position. I think that's probably that direction that we are going to go um, down the road. So uh, for, for me personally, the research objective have been to isolate uh, the differences between richly endowed and poorly endowed assemblages by a comprehensive review and compilation of the, the relevant uh, and representative geological data that, uh, that is available. So I'll go through, through that and then we'll just look at a, like a couple of examples on, on how we are using that. So, so the, first, uh, the first step was to sort of decide on, on the compilations that we needed and uh, the, the, the two we, we have sort of focused on is the lithological assemblage map and, uh, and then um, the again, assemblage compilation as well. And uh, for the most part, I've been using the DSC bedrock data model uh, tools that um, I'm, they might be uh, obsolete now because uh, ArcGIS is pretty much sh shutting down ArcMap and is moving to ArcPro. But I, the last thing I heard from uh, Rebecca Monchon was actually that she was going to, uh, that she got a grant to uh, develop that. And the, the neat thing about that tool is that it's capable of the, um, of storing a lot of metadata. Uh, so when you're doing these compilations that, that you know where uh, this stuff is coming from. So that, that, that is captured every time uh, I've constrained an, a boundary or a contact here on the assemblage map. Uh, you, you should be able to see where that line is coming from um, in the metadata. So if we start with the uh, lithological map, that is a compilation uh, because the Epitipi is pretty much divided in, in uh, two halves, one to the Ontario side and one to the Quebec side. And uh, their geological department do not uh, necessarily map at the same scale or at this, with the same detail. Um, so the, 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 big, the big part of the, the, the lithological compilation was really to try and merge that uh, and find a, a sort of common denominator to make a unified map across the entire Epitipi. And uh, we wanted that so we could, could quantify some of these geological features to start interrogating VMS endowment. So this is just uh, a look at the, all the, the polygons there combined in one. Uh, so there's a lot of data there, uh, you know, decades of work by geologists at the, at the surveys. Um, and then after combining that, uh, it was sort of time to decide uh, how to uh, how to uh, to merge it in terms of the lithologies and and here I'm just showing you the legend for the OGS side which is about 20 entries and uh, for the Quebec side it was 362 uh, but only 135 in the Apatipi so so uh, <coughs> it's still an order of magnitude uh, almost uh, different there. So, so th that was like the first step to try and cook that down and, and find out a way to, to, um, to, to lump together the, the Quebec side and, and get it into uh, the, um, the Ontario side. Another, uh, another issue, or not issue, but like 
one of the details in the, on the Quebec side is that, that oftentimes their polygons would have more than one rock type. So there would be multiple uh, different uh, lithologies, I guess, within each polygon. Um, and one of the assumptions there that, that uh, we made was to, to, um, to view the first entry as the dominant uh, lithology within a polygon. So there you could sort of sort that out in Excel and, uh, and, and, um, and get it down to just one lithology per uh, polygon and then back and uh, do some more Excel work to, uh, to sort of merge uh, the, um, the, the Quebec legend into uh, an Ontario uh, legend and then everything was sort of leveled. So that um, resulted in going from, from what you see up here, which is a bit psychedelic, uh, to something more uniform. Uh, so at first, the, the first sort of a visual appearance there, uh, it seemed to, to sort of work to some extent. Uh, you can see that there are some holes down here. Um, there's, there's some problems in detail in terms of the, the, um, the um, intermediate rocks and uh, one, like, one, of the, one of the things that we actually decided doing was to, to lump the, the mafix and uh, the intermediates together, at least for now. So with, with a couple of more steps, uh, we went from this to, uh, to now sort of a uniform map where you can see ultramafic uh, metavolcanic rocks, uh, mafic to intermediate rocks, and felsic rocks. And then you also have uh, the uh, sedimentary assemblages of these, the sediments that, that, um, that we have in the Abitibi, and then a bunch of intrusive rocks as well. So all the line work is sort of the foundation for the assemblage map, together with uh, a lot of the great work that uh, Phil and John has done uh, through the years, and also uh, more recently, the compilation done by uh, Dubé and uh, Patrick. Um, and, um, and, and those were sort of uh, very informative in terms of uh, building our, our new assemblage map uh, for the Abitibi, together with all the new uh, geochronology and all the new mapping that has been done by uh, Middle Earth researchers um, to sort of constrain uh, to the best of our ability, uh, you know, the, the assemblage as, as we think it should look. Like one example, you can see down here Swayze uh, in the more recent compilation here, a lot of the, um, of the Kit Monroe down there, uh, which Tom now through more geochronology has, uh, has managed to, uh, to update. So that, so the uh, the result there is is uh, what you're looking at here. Um, so still uh, leaning on uh, a lot of the sort of the nomenclature. We we've tried to break out lower, lower and upper uh, assemblages uh, for the Blake River and Tisdale and Kit Monroe. I don't know if that I mean that that's something that when we uh, release this to the world that you know people can can lump those, those together uh, fairly easily if if they so decide. Uh, but but uh, with that you can you can start seeing you know the total surface area um, for uh, for each assemblage across the Abitibi and uh, and start making some of these uh, initial calculations uh, to evaluate these different units. So we're we're gonna put this up on the uh, on the <laughs> on the. Um, on the on the Laurentian server, unfortunately, we got hacked recently. So, I tried to get a screen dump for that uh, yesterday, but that, that was as far as I got. But uh, with with a little bit of gymnastics um, uh, from uh, Puran, uh, she's promised to help getting some rid of some of these ghost polygons and all this kind of crap uh, before we release it. But but hopefully we'll have this up on the, on the website um, in the, in in a very short period of time, so that uh, some people can can take it and use it. And hopefully nobody works uh, faster than me to, <laughs> to get the, a publication out, but, uh, but I'll just show you a couple of things that, uh, that we intend to do with it. Um, and uh, th this will, I, I don't know about the, the, the final format, will probably be, you know, uh, sort of RTIS, QGIS um, um, uh, compatible. 
so it should be something that companies can just take and run with and uh, you know make make their own updates because because uh, the one thing I know for sure is that there's a lot of mistakes uh, and there's a lot of a lot of new things that that's happening all the time every time I go to Shijem uh, uh, the Quebec uh, survey there's there's a new update uh, and uh, you know that's the kind of thing that you get gray hairs but but now if we release this people can just use it and update it as, as they please so anyway I'll just show you a couple of examples now that um, that that will hopefully show you how, how we're gonna use it um, just starting with with sort of the felsic rock so what we can do is um, you know is simp if they like, combine these two compilations we can we can we can first isolate all the the felsic rocks that's what you see on the on the right side here and then uh, you know start constraining with the assemblages what what are the the, the felsic rocks within within each assemblage what is the ultramafix what what are the the mafix proportions so here you just have all the pie shots in the middle here the assemblages and then you go out to one of these pie shots and we can look at the Blake River first and you can see about nine nine percent of the of the Blake River is is felsix so just to to point out what uh, Octavio was just saying not a lot of uh, of felsix in the, in the Stockton rock mower so that might play into it, the exact sort of the conclusion he draw from uh, from from his uh, geochemical analysis the, the the first thing I was doing too was just to let's try and plot these felsic proportions against the, uh, the the number of deposits and tonnage. I'm probably not going to convince anybody that there's there's a, a a strong correlation here, but you can do that with some of the other rock types too, like the the um, the uh, ultramafix, and that fails completely. But at least here you can see that you know there might be some relationship. But when it comes to the felsics. Um, Obviously, it's not a new thing that that, uh, that the VMS is associated with that, and the way we are interpreting it as, you know, a, a product of crustal melting, high heat flow, a lot of rifting, uh, the emplacement of of, the, of crustal magmas in the in the shallow uh, subsurface, and all these things, um, and of course, indic indic indicative of of a favorable environment to form uh, VMS deposits, and. For the felsics as well, uh, they've been very popular. Um, for this F classification, this is uh, this is a nice little table in Fassbender's, uh, probably building on Hart's um, uh, work as well. Uh, for for what these different proxies sort of mean, and you know we have the F ones that are typically associated with deeper a deeper source probably and uh, and sort of shallower sources when you get into the f3s and uh, and that's that's why they have often been sort of a good target for uh, for a vms for vms uh, deposits so now that we have sort of constraints on um, the the proportion of felsic rocks in the assemblages it was it would be fun to go in uh, and look at the, the, some, of, some of these VMS districts to see if there's a change there, because even though people through the years have said that, yeah, that the felt, it's good to have the felsic rocks <laughs> with the VMS, they're often host to the VMS deposits, but is there, like, can we actually see it if we, we, if we try and quantify it? Is there, uh, can, can we show it with this data set now that we are able to, uh, to sort of constrain it by assemblage and all these things? So these are just a lot of the, the the bigger VMS districts. There's obviously more deposits in the Abitibi than just this, but but these are just some of the ones that that I highlighted for this talk. And the you know the VMS district is sort of um, a bit arbitrary. There was a, there's a paper like some years ago that was looking at gold districts where they chose a radius of 30 kilometers, I think, um, as like uh, around the the biggest mine in the district. So I've done sort of this the same thing, but narrowed it down a little bit because we're not we're not looking at these um, you know potential uh, larger gold districts where where uh, you know the breaks are running for hundreds of kilometers or some and something along those lines. So this is just an example. Um, so going into Noranda, and uh, we are only looking at the at the uh, felsic rocks here. Um, the, so, so we're um, 
We're taking the Noranda area here. It's centered on the horn deposits, which is sitting right about there. And then, the, the, because we have the assemblage map now, we, we can sort of, uh, we can really constrain it by assemblage so that we are not, you know, accidentally taking in a bunch of, of felsic rocks from some other assemblage. So here, that, that is simply, that is essentially constrained now by, uh, by assemblage. And then we can do uh, a, a, calcula a simple calculation here uh, to get the surface area. And you can see for Noranda, you know, it's, it's, it's more than twice the amount of, of the felsic, felsic, felsic rocks by proportion uh, compared to the assemblage as a whole. So it really sort of demonstrates that, that um, you know, Noranda, there, there's, a, there's, there's an anomaly there in terms of, the, of all these goodies that, that you want to wanna see in, in a VMS environment. So you can do this for all the districts, and the sort of general trend that you'll see is that some of them will be around the average, but many of them will, will have this increased uh, uh, proportion of felsic rocks when you get into, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, VMS district. Uh, and you can see a lot of the, these odd shapes here are because we are constraining these areas by, by, um, by the assemblages. But again, you know, up to 33% uh, uh, felsic rocks uh, in, in Camp, Co Camp Kosha camp there. Uh, and a bunch that are, you know, five or 4% higher than, uh, than the um, that, than the average of, of the assemblage that they belong to. Okay, so I thought the, it, I mean, one one of the lessons that we got from the Randa because that's also where we uh, we got one of the Middle Earth transects um, was really that that these are sort of aerial restricted but vertically extensive deep crustal mantle magmatic hydrothermal systems. Uh, in other words, if you look at the MT 3D model here, and uh, and the section uh, along one of the same volcanic faults in the area, and uh, I don't know if you uh, if you made a, a mental image of uh, of the Noranda camp from one of those smaller maps there, but we're looking sort of up below here, and you can see the Flavrian intrusion here, and all the deposits sit here. Uh, so so these these uh, these fingers are coming down from right underneath the, the big deposits and, uh, and are connecting to, to deeper, 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 um, uh, deeper uh, uh, conductive, conductive areas in the lower crust. And, you know, the, the geowizards told me to cut it off here, but, you know, there, <laughs> there might even be a connection all the way down there. The other thing uh, that I wanted to mention was like there is this intersection with metal ocean uh, that are doing like phenomenal work, uh, and I was just looking at some data yesterday that I thought I'd highlight that we just to show that we are also sort of piggybacking off all the the research they are doing. So this is this is from uh, Mark Fassbender's uh, paper from last year, where he did a compilation. Um, of, of the felsic rocks on the modern seafloor. Uh, and the really neat thing there is that um, over the last couple of decades, Mark can, can uh, probably correct me if I'm wrong here, the, the database of felsic rocks in these environments have, have grown to, uh, to new levels where you can, you, you got felsic rocks from all these different environments. So that, had, that really allowed him to do a, a statistical analysis and, and divide um, divide uh, all these felsic rocks into to different groups, but where we also had the constraint of the, the uh, tectonic environment on the ocean floor. Like uh, one of the really neat things, I guess, that they, they, they found out was that, that what we are looking for in the Achaean, uh, like in the Apitipi, like when we're looking for the SF3s, a lot of times, uh, like on the modern seafloor, you'll actually see these in multiple different sort of tectonic settings. Um, the problem for them is that, that they all go down the, the escalator <laughs> and uh, are being destroyed uh, through subduction. Uh, but, but one of the things that they are sort of uh, thinking about is, is whether this micro 
plate mosaic uh, scenario is applicable um, to the Achaean because we have, you know, uh, thicker crust and uh, more heat. So that might be why these are preserved in the Achaean record um, rather than, than the modern. But not to go into much, too much detail there because uh, I'll just sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. So nonetheless, um, after compiling that and looking at that, we can also sort of uh, you know try and compare that to the modern uh, to the to the ancient record, and that that's that's what uh, Mark also did, um, and and we can see that there's there's a lot of these things that they, they share all the all the same features here, like all, the whole range. So I, I sort of modified that, and I'll leave with this slide. Um, I modified uh, his diagrams a little bit, so now the color coding is actually for some of his classes uh, that are uh, representative of, of the different tectonic settings. And um, I guess the first thing to just point out in, in, in that uh, paper is to, to just um, acknowledge that, that when you look at these, all these different settings, you can just see like within some of the district I showed you before, uh, they, they um, correspond to, to a diverse settings in the, on the modern seafloor. So that in itself, I think, also goes to what Tom was talking about yesterday, that uh, you know, the Blake River is not the same everywhere. So that, I think, is, a, is one of those things that like, by seeing all this data coming from the uh, metal ocean, I think it's something that is also sort of really helping us uh, going in, in certain directions or explore different avenues. And um, the last thing I'll leave with is just, uh, just the fact that, that this vertical extensive thing that we got from Noranda and, uh, and looking at you know, the, the generation of these different F-type F, uh, uh, rhyolites and whatnot, um, I was comparing it yesterday to where you have gold-rich deposits. So down here is the classification of uh, Patrick uh, into auriferous and uh, gold-rich and anomalous, gold anomalous deposits. And, the, and if you go back and you look at these different uh, camps, uh, what you'll see is that the, the gold-rich uh, camps, they, they will often span both F2, F3, and F1s. So that's true for DBL, it's true for Noranda, Selby, Lemoyne in the Shibugumi camp. Um, so I just thought that was kind of a neat observation, whereas some of these other camps that do not have any uh, gold-rich deposits are only in the F2 and F3. So maybe, Maybe there's some refining there that we can do as well uh, with, resp with respect to the gold-rich deposits, and also how these, uh, how this might also show that, like, you know, the Kitman Row is is a like there. There's multiple different tectonic settings within the Abitibi, you know, at the same time, just as they they see uh, in the modern ocean. Um, yeah. I think I'll leave it there.